Ocean, a giant sea containing many mysteries that humans have yet to discover. The ocean has been a source of life for people since ancient times. It provides people with food, maritime knowledge, as well as brings them many difficulties. Indeed, at the end of the 8th century, there was a people who developed a base on the ocean. They were famous as sea warriors. They floated on their characteristic dragon-headed boat through the seas. Or, discovering many new lands. Surely, you have also heard of this nation, a warrior tribe with a heroic, indomitable spirit, a nation with the strongest will in history. They are Vikings. In today's video, we will learn all about the Vikings. Um, I have been very curious about the movies, about hot-tempered and fierce Vikings, how they lived and developed in places with some of the harshest conditions in the world. Let's start the journey now. Look what the Vikings did 500 years ago, and what have we learned from them? The Viking Age began in the late 8th century and lasted until the mid-11th century. Vikings were an ethnic group living in Northern Europe, in today's Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. When we mention Vikings, we often think of images of warriors or fierce pirates. The Vikings were famous as roving warriors on ships or pirates. In addition, they are also explorers, traders, and fierce warriors. Originating from the Scandinavian peninsula, Viking warriors from Denmark, Sweden, and Norway invaded and plundered many lands in Europe, stretching from north to south, from west to east, in the period from 793 to 1066. They conquered many great seas, from the Baltic coast, inland Russia, to lands as far away as Great Britain and the Mediterranean coast, leaving Europe covered in blood red. And the fire of battle. As early as the 870s, Vikings from Norway and Denmark settled in Ireland, making it the land of the Vikings. To this day, Icelanders are still very proud of their Viking origins. The Vikings are famous for their brutality, which has been shown clearly through films and novels. However, where does that personality come from? How did farmers from Scandinavia become the nightmare of the entire European continent? A Northern Europe is home to ancient glacial terrain. Most of this area is located in the continental temperate zone and is cold. The temperature on the warmest days does not exceed 10 degrees Celsius, and on the coldest days it reaches 50 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the natural resources here are not diverse. Most plants will have difficulty growing, mainly large trees that grow in clusters like pine forests. Animals also need thick fur, or a large amount of fat, to cope with the cold like seals, sheep. Not only animals, people here also need their own characteristics to be able to adapt to the environment here. They may have lived mainly on herding and hunting. They earn food by fishing on the beaches. Because of cold weather, they will go on long trips at sea to catch a large quantity to reserve for days when the weather is too bad. They would also need other food sources such as sheep, cows or seals to improve their meals and especially to make clothes to keep them from getting cold. Shirts made of cow hide, seal skin and sheep skin will be essential. There is another very important thing to mention. The Vikings loved drinking beer. It both warmed the body and helped them work harder to forget the harsh cold. Finally, they need to have a strong will and not give in. They float on the sea, both to fish and to be able to explore new lands. They started living in small Scandinavia from the beginning of the 8th century. Then by the end of the 11th century, they were present all over Europe. This proves that they are truly explorers with extensive maritime knowledge. They travel a lot and gain experience so that future generations can develop better. The Vikings were greedy pirates. Scandinavia was too small to satisfy their ambitions. Growing up in harsh conditions, finding a new land with a better climate was always the top goal. So they sailed around Europe searching wherever they went, they would plunder food, valuable objects, and even take over the land there. About 1 to 200 years ago, the first Vikings descended on mainland Scotland, crushing local resistance to land grabs. The ruins of a Viking longhouse were found on the Scottish islands, recalling a proud past of the islanders. After defeating the local inhabitants, the Vikings ruled Scotland for almost seven centuries. From the shores of their Scandinavian homeland, 
between the Baltic and North Seas, the Vikings sailed far and wide from the 8th century, exploring much of Europe over the next 300 years. With boats that are beautifully designed and suitable to be able to go to sea for many days at a time. Seafaring experience was something the Vikings were always proud of. They traveled to at least 37 countries around the world, from Afghanistan to Canada, according to archaeologist Neil Price of Uppsala University, Sweden. Along the way, they interacted and traded luxury goods with more than 50 different cultures. They wore Eurasian belts, Chinese silk shirts, and filled their pockets with Muslim coins. They built thriving cities at York and Kiev, vast British, Icelandic, and French colonies, and established outposts in Greenland and North America. However, exploration and trade were not the only ways that brought wealth to the Vikings. Viking pirates attacked the shores of England and Europe with surprise and were known for their ferocity. In northern France, they went up and down the Seine and many other rivers, attacking and filling their boats with the plunder they took. They blackmailed the economy of the Carolingian Empire in Western Europe in exchange for promises of peace. Across the English Channel, sporadic raids expanded into all-out war as Viking armies invaded and conquered Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, leaving corpses to rot in the fields. To describe the Vikings at that time, it could be said that they were Europe's nightmare, famous for being aggressive and brutal, always using violence to solve problems. So what created such a scary Viking? Life in Scandinavia went through difficult times over three decades before the Vikings began their journey to conquer the coast. This period saw the emergence of more than 30 small kingdoms, vying for power and territory in a difficult context. Around the year 536 AD, a terrible tragedy struck this region. A large dust cloud spread through the atmosphere, possibly caused by the impact of comets or meteorites on Earth along with the eruption of at least one giant volcano. This event obscured sunlight, and summer temperatures dropped significantly over the next 14 years. Long years of cold and darkness brought death and destruction to Scandinavia, a land at the heart of medieval agriculture. In the upland region of Sweden, nearly 75% of villages have been abandoned. Residents could not endure the famine and conflict related to the tragedy they faced. The story of the disaster of 536 AD seems to form an important part of the legend of Ragnarök, the final war of Norse mythology, where everything ends and destruction is inevitable. The great dust cloud spread in the atmosphere turning the sun black, starting from Fimbul winter, when the long, freezing winter began. But when summer finally returned and the population gradually recovered, Scandinavian society took on a new form, a more brutal one. Viking leaders built up armed forces and occupied abandoned lands. The War of Kings emerged, creating a military society glorifying warrior virtues such as courage, aggression, cunning, and strength. On the Swedish island of Gotland, where many intact graves from this period have been discovered, they found graves where most of the men were buried with weapons, while this armed society was taking shape, a groundbreaking new technology, the sail, marked a major advance in seafaring in 7th century Scandinavia. These ships with sails capable of harnessing the power of the wind allowed northern lords and their armies to move quickly across the Baltic and North Seas. New lands were discovered, towns and villages were plundered, and lands were colonized. It's impossible to talk about Vikings without mentioning their ships, which we often hear by the fearsome name Drakkar. In fact, the early medieval Scandinavians had many types of ships, and they were all different from each other, just as today's Mats is different from a Mercedes. For commercial voyages, Canar and Kai Skip are two commonly used ships. For military campaigns to capture prey, Skade, which can be translated as Cutwater, and Drakar, or Dragon. The name such ships were given because of the custom of carving a dragon's head on the hull like so. According to experts, this type of warship appeared between the 9th and 13th centuries. This was the time when the Vikings actively explored and invaded Europe. The Vikings cut down huge oak trees to build Drakkar more than 10 meters long. The ship was also equipped with a large sail supported by a block of wood called a keelson. It helped spread the weight of the mast 
and stretch the sail. Thanks to that, the ship can move smoothly on the sea as well as rivers. Drakkar can be said to be the first Viking ships. The main material for building boats is pine. At that time, pine was chosen, mainly because it was both light and resistant. The boats have curved bows, all decorated with impressive drawings and dragon heads, especially the dragon head in front of the boat. Slim design with a flared boat shape in the middle, narrow body and length, from 18 to 25 mm shallow and flat bottom, mast about 20 mm high, square sail painted with a dragon or snake. The most special thing about the Viking ship is the paddle system stretching throughout the ship's hull, helping the driver easily increase speed and maintain speed when the wind is calm. These factors made the Viking ship an invincible warship with extraordinary speed at that time. The Vikings built many types of ships, including warships, smuggling and trade ships and exploration and adventure ships. So far, we have talked a lot about Drakkar, a type of Viking warship, their pride. Perhaps you can already imagine its structure from its body, mass to its more prominent dragon head. But in addition to being a warship, Drakkar was also used for smuggling and trade purposes by the Vikings. Smuggling and trading boats are often large in size, allowing them to carry more goods. Their slim bodies help them quickly cross the sea, carrying with them feelings of expanding trade and commerce. When you see a Drakkar full of goods, imagine the lives, stories, and eager traders of the sea. Now, did you know, the adventures on Viking ships are truly a mystical picture of exploration and bravery. Not only do they surf huge waves, but they also challenge incredibly harsh sea conditions. There are some famous Viking journeys that we need to talk about, such as the adventures of Leif Erikson, who led an expedition to a new land, called Vineland, now the land of Canada. It's definitely not an easy journey, right? If you think that wild wolves only appear in fairy tales, then you are mistaken. Viking adventures often face unexpected challenges such as packs of ferocious wolves, biting cold winds, and sometimes attacks by local tribes. That is real life, unlike the dreamy pictures we often see. People still tell each other heroic stories about the Vikings' voyages of discovery at sea. They pride themselves on their strong spirit, never giving up, always looking for new things. The Vikings lived in Norway many years ago, then they traveled the sea, continued their journey to discover Iceland. They traveled throughout Europe and were always looking for new lands when they arrived. Old places have become too cramped to live in. In the famous Viking tales, the first person to try to find new lands was a man named Erik Thorvaldsson, and he will be known to history as Erik the Red. Erik the Red was born around the year 950 in Norway, which had just been unified into a single state. Norway has a rugged, undulating coastline divided by wooded fjords, large mountain coves, and dotted with rocky sea islands. Perhaps as a boy, he must have watched ships sail into the sunset, watching them sink below the horizon, and he must have imagined and thought about adventures, stormy sea journeys. When Eric was a child, his father killed a man during an argument. In Norway, murderers have more than just the law to fear. Most Vikings had hot-tempered personalities and were willing to shed blood, especially for relatives and family. Viking honor does not allow those who harm the family to live in peace. Fearing retaliation, Eric's family crossed the sea to the newest settlement, the icy land of Iceland, where smoke was said to rise from the ground itself, traveling by boat on the sea, dark fog, cold sea breeze and constantly changing waves. Perhaps this migration journey inspired Eric in his future decisions to seek and explore new lands. In the second half of the 10th century, Iceland was settled by Norway. The Norse brought a large number of slaves from Ireland and Scotland to help them live in their new colony. They brought essential animals with them such as horses, cattle and rabbits here. Iceland snow forests are cut down to make way for clifftop farmland to grow crops. There, people eat cod from the sea, not salted, but dried on wooden racks against the wind and cold. These settlement success stories also meant 
that most of the best land was already inhabited. When Eric arrived with his family, all that was left was an uninhabited wasteland in the northwestern tundra. But that was all the options they had, and Thorvald and his family decided to live here. They settled down and began working on their farm. When we were children, surely everyone heard mysterious stories about strange and unknown things. So did Eric. Perhaps young Eric was told adventure stories by his father, or sailors. At sea, when fishing or transporting goods between Iceland and Norway, we all know that at that time they traveled on the sea without using a compass at all. But based on their experiences, based on the direction of movement of seabirds or whales. However, if they are unlucky enough to encounter storms at sea or dark fog, they may lose direction and get lost in new seas and lands. After Eric's father passed away, Eric grew up and started his own family, living on the farm his father left behind. Not only that, he also inherited his father's hot temper and pride. That's why some things happened to him that were similar to his father's previous life. One day, due to some unfortunate events, a worker at Eric's farm had a disagreement with a family on the neighboring farm. The two homeowners seemed to have very hot-tempered personalities, and there was a conflict. Eric's workers were murdered. As is normal when it comes to his honor and pride, Eric decided to take revenge. The two sides rushed into each other, and in the end, Eric prevailed. Two neighbors were killed. Just like his father in the past, Eric is afraid that someone will come and take revenge on his family, which could lead to a war between generations. But then, the law took over again. Eric was convicted of murder and banished from Iceland for three years. In the year 982, Eric decided to leave his homeland with his family to search for the legendary New World. In fact, he had nowhere else to go. In his native Iceland, and in the warm embrace of the North Atlantic Ocean, the journey began. They have to travel on a journey of more than 115 Tanerno Kaurasur by sea. After countless difficulties at sea, they found Greenland, an unexpected paradise in the middle of the sea. Eric followed a route from Western Iceland and discovered Northern Greenland in North America. Unlike Columbus's later transatlantic route from Spain, Eric's family's route was much closer, but their route was in the far north and involved cold climates, extreme cold, that would have been difficult to overcome. Stand. At first hearing the names Iceland and Greenland, you can roughly imagine the climate of these two lands. But in reality, Iceland has no ice, and Greenland is covered in snow all year round. Iceland lies on a rift between tectonic plates. Iceland's geological activity includes geysers and frequent volcanic eruptions. The interior consists of a volcanic plateau, characterized by sand and lava fields, mountains and glaciers, and many glaciers that flow to the sea through the lowlands. Iceland is warmed by the Gulf Stream and has a temperate climate despite being located at a latitude just south of the Arctic Circle. Although the name is Iceland, currently only 11% of the land area is covered by permafrost. The rest in the summer Iceland still has a large green area every year. In contrast, about 80% of Greenland's surface is covered by ice known as the Greenland Ice Cap. Between 800 and 1300, southern Greenland was much greener than it is today. But by the 14th century, Greenland's average temperature plummeted. Falling temperatures mean fewer crops, and winters are brutally cold. When he set foot on this island, Eric looked around and realized there was no one here. He became depressed and lonely, but how could Eric bear it when he had a house and neighbors around him? and an idea suddenly flashed the moment he arrived. Eric would name this island Greenland and wait for the three years of being expelled. He would return and convince everyone in Iceland to settle with him. You hear? Just as planned. Three years later, Eric returned to Iceland and convinced everyone. Through Eric's words, Greenland is a very warm, beautiful, fertile, green place. You now, when all that snow and ice and that biting cold were buried by Eric, a beautiful pink island as described by Eric captivates many people. Unexpectedly successful, Eric amassed a fleet of 25 ships filled with men, women, children, construction materials and livestock. An amazing sight, 25 sails on dragon-headed boats crossing the ocean waves. On the sea voyage, because they traveled through icy and harsh lands, they encountered countless difficulties. 
In the end of these 25 ships, only 14 ships with about 300 people traveled from Iceland to this fertile Greenland region with Eric. As soon as they arrived at a paradise through Eric's story, they immediately trembled when they arrived, partly because of the emotion of having gone through a difficult journey, partly because of the bone-chilling cold of this place, but they cannot return anymore. Overcoming the mental shock, they settled here, built houses of wood and stone, grew food, and raised sheep and goats that they brought from Iceland with them. By around 1003, Greenland had up to 5,000 inhabitants. Life here isn't rosy, it's just like Iceland is bigger and colder. The climate difference between Greenland and Iceland created new challenges, but it did not dampen the adventurous spirit of the Vikings. After arriving in Greenland, Eric established the eastern settlement on the southern tip of Greenland around 985 CE, choosing the most selective land for himself and his family, and establishing a farm called Bratelid, meaning Eriksfeld. Eric, his wife, and three sons lived happily together, until Eric passed away. Among his children, there was one who later had a journey to explore new lands and became very famous. His second son named Leif Eriksson, also nicknamed Leif the Lucky. Leif was born in Iceland around 960 AD. According to Viking tradition, Leif did not grow up with his family. Instead, when he was eight years old, he moved in with a man named Thyrker. Thyrker came from Germany where Eric the Red captured him, brought him to Iceland, but did not enslave him. Thyrker taught Leif everything he needed to know, including reading and writing runes, Celtic and Russian, and how to trade. Leif was also taught ancient stories, plant research, and the use of weapons. When Leif wasn't studying, he and his friends would watch the ship's dock. Then he would listen to the sailors' stories. At the age of 12, Leif was considered a man and returned to his father's house. Eric's house has grown since Leif left. Herds of livestock increased, and there were new homes and more slaves. But then his father committed the crime mentioned above and his family had to move to Greenland. During Eric's years in Greenland during his deportation, he explored the new land and taught Leif many things about life and maritime experiences. At the age of 24, Leif was asked to captain his first voyage. The purpose was to bring gifts to King Olaf in Norway. Many preparations had been made, and Leif was very excited. Leif took with him a crew of 14 men and Tharker, the wind that Leif was sailing in, was fair at first. But after their first day, it slowed to just a breeze. It was five days before they saw Iceland. Most trips are done in two parts. The crew wanted to go to shore, but Leif wouldn't let them, so they continued rowing. They sailed for days, and Leif thought they would run out of food. Finally, they sighted some small islands, the Hebrides. They realized they had gone further south than planned. The day they arrived, a storm hit and did not allow them to leave for a month. During this time, Leif stayed in the house of the Lord of the Island. There lived the Lord's daughter, named Thorguna. She was known to weave tapestries and was said to have learned witchcraft. Before Leif arrived in Norway, Thorguna told him that she was about to give birth to his child and that she predicted that it would be a boy. She gave birth to a child and named him Thorgils. When the storm cleared, Leif sailed for Norway. The wind was good, and they reached there in a few days. When he arrived, many people came to greet him, and a messenger came to take him to King Olaf's court. When the messenger told the king who he was, he replied, Leif Erikson, I know your father well. The king was so impressed with Leif that he invited Leif to stay in Norway. Leif decided there was no reason to rush back to Greenland, so he accepted the offer. While in Norway, he marveled at all the wonderful things and rested in the lap of luxury. One day, while playing chess with Leif, King Olaf told him about how he also worshipped the same gods that Leif worshipped. King Olaf also told him about how the plague had hit Norway and how many people had died. He then told Leif how he turned his back on those gods and began worshipping the living Christ. He was baptized along with thousands of Norwegians, and then the plague ended. Leif, not loyal to the Viking gods, was very interested in Christianity. He finally agreed to be baptized and accepted this new faith. On his return journey, he brought a priest with him to spread the Christian faith to Greenland.
Sometime after Leif returned to Greenland, he became restless. He decided to find the lands to the west that Bjarni had talked about. So he bought Bjarni's boat and set off with Thyrkar and some men north following Bjarni's route. After sailing up the west coast of Greenland, he sailed west 600 miles and found a land of glaciers and high rocks. They landed but were disappointed because the land seemed to be just a giant slab of rock. Because of this, he named it Heluland, Slab Land, or Flat Rock Land, now known as Baffin Island. Leif then sailed south and found another land. When up shore, he found it flat with white sand beaches and some trees. He named this land Markland, Woodland, which today is said to be the east coast of Canada. Leif then sailed southeast for two days and reached an island with land behind. On this land, the dew on the grass seems as sweet as honey. Here, Leif built a number of pavilions or temporary shelters. However, the land here was so rich that he decided to build at least one large house for the winter. In this land, there were salmon larger than any the Vikings had ever seen before. There were also very rich pastures for their livestock, which they brought some with them, and there were rich forests covering this land. After the houses were built, Leif sent a group of explorers to explore the land. After one of these expeditions, Thyrker did not return. The men searched for him all day and finally found him the next morning. When they found him, he was very excited and babbling in German. After calming down, he explained to everyone that he had found Grapes on this land. Leif ordered his men to load Grapes and wooden to boats. Then they settled in for the winter. But winter here is very special, no frost comes to the grass. They also noticed that days and nights here were more equal in length. When spring came and the men were ready to leave, Leif named the land Vineland, meaning Wineland or Pastureland. We now know Leif's Vinland as Lonso Meadows in Newfoundland. Through story of Eric the Red and his son are prime examples of how the Vikings were the world's leading explorers. They are present in most of Europe and even in North America, both to settle and to trade goods with other countries. Viking culture was also spread and recorded in many different parts of the world. Records show that they worshipped Norse gods such as Odin, Thor, Frigg, etc. They had their own stories about the gods and the origin of the universe. In Norse mythology, there exists an infinite abyss called Ginnungagap. Ginnungagap exists between two opposite areas. In the north, it is covered with cold called Niflheim or Land of Ice. From Niflheim, there is a well called Fergalmir, from which flow eleven rivers collectively known as Elivagar, Glacier. And in the south is the always fiery region called Muspelsheim, or the desolate land ruled by the giant Sutur tribe. When the fire of Muspelsheim melted the ice of Niflheim, that melted ice flowed into Ginnungagap and merged with Elivagar to create the first creature of the universe, the giant Emir or Argelmir. From the sweat under Amir's armpits, a pair of giant men and women were born. And from there were born the frost giants. The hoarfrost continued to melt, creating the giant cow, Artumla. Emir drinks cow's milk to survive and develop her race. Audhumla continued eating by licking the salt ice. One day, when the cow Audhumla was licking the ice, the ice revealed its hair, the second day it revealed its head, and the third day it gave birth to its entire body. From there, the good Buri was born, Zasus. Buri gave birth to a son named Bor. Bor married Bestle, daughter of the giant Boltathorn, and gave birth to three children, Odin, Vili, and Ve. As Ymir grew bigger and more cruel, the three brothers, Odin, Vili, and Ve, decided to kill Ymir. From Ymir's corpse grew the divine tree Yggdrasil, and the gods began to build the world. Ymir's blood formed seas and lakes. His body became earth. His brain became clouds. His bones became mountains. His teeth became rocks. Skulls form the dome of the sky, overseen by four dwarves creating the four directions of east, west, south, and north. Immediately after Odin, Vili and Ve opened the world. They created the first humans from the trees on the beach. The man Asker and the woman Imbla. Odin gave humans breath and soul. Vili gave emotions and perception, and V gave senses and appearance. 
Humans live in a land in the middle of a vast era called Midgard, Middle Earth. Earth, or Midgard, is a flat disk placed on the branch of the World Tree Yggdrasil. Odin and the gods are somewhere else at the center of the World Tree called Asgard. Odin is the supreme being and ruler of Asgard and the Nine Worlds, known as the All-Father, or Father of the Gods, he married the beautiful goddess Frigg. Together, they later had children, and the most famous of them is the mighty god of thunder, Thor. To travel between the Nine Worlds, he created a magical bridge called the Bifrost, that often appeared as a rainbow bridge, watching over the Bifrost as the gatekeeper, God Heimdall, or Watcher of the Gods. God, he has the ability to see through universes day and night. The gods live in splendid palaces and together govern the Nine Worlds. One of the most famous palaces is Valhalla, a place for brave warriors to sacrifice on the battlefield. Odin and Thor are the two gods most worshipped by Vikings because they are the embodiment of power and extraordinary strength. The Vikings also named the days of the week after gods, such as Tyr for Tuesday, Odin for Wednesday, Thor for Thursday, and Frigg for Friday. As mentioned above, around 536 AD, a terrible tragedy struck this region. A large dust cloud spreading in the atmosphere had a negative effect on the Viking region, causing temperature changes, crop failures, and prolonged famine. Based on that event, the legend of Ragnarok was born. Ragnarok is a series of apocalyptic events that herald the end of the world, an event that was predicted, but was inevitable. When ice giants and fire giants will join forces against the gods in a death battle that will ultimately destroy the earth, plunging it beneath the sea. At this battle, most of the gods died, including Odin and Thor. No. Nope. In Viking society, men would have more power. Women had a certain amount of personal power depending on their social status. When Viking men were away from homeworking, raiding, fishing, exploring, or carrying out trading missions, Women in Viking society took on all of the men's work as well as doing their own. Women are valuable members of society, and it is shameful when men harm women. Women's roles were housework, taking care of the family, preparing food, doing laundry, milking cows, sheep and goats, making butter and cheese, preserving food for the winter. Gardening, cleaning, and the most time-consuming job is sewing clothes for the family. Spinning, carding, weaving, cutting, and sewing take a lot of time. It could take a Viking woman 35 hours to spin enough yarn for a day of weaving, so you know how much time it took to make clothes. Viking women married as early as 12 years old. By age 20, almost all men and women are married. Life expectancy is about 50 years, but most died long before reaching the age of 50. Only a few lived to 60 years old. The marriage was arranged by the young couple's parents. Marriage is a contract between two families, the groom's family pays the bride price to the bride's family when the two get engaged. When getting married, the bride's father paid a dowry. Since both families invest financially in the new couple, marriage is a matter for both families as well as those involved. Viking children did not go to school as we know them today. Rather, boys learned all the jobs taught by men, taught by fathers, brothers, and uncles. The girls learn with their mothers and aunts how to cook, garden, care for pets, and sew clothes. By the time they reach adulthood, between the ages of 12 and 15, both boys and girls can run a household and farm effectively. As always, there are exceptions to these general rules of social behavior. When men settled Iceland, Greenland, and Vinland, women went with them. Vikings settled in England, Ireland, and France as families. However, only men go fishing and trading, while women stay at home to take care of the farm. Women in Viking society had more power than most other European women at the time. They can divorce their husbands, own some property, and sell their own crafts. Some women became wealthy landowners. Others were involved in trade. Scales used to weigh silver used in trade have been found in women's graves. Some weapons were even found in women's graves giving rise to the notion that some women were warriors alongside their men. However, most women in Viking society lived and worked in the home. Viking culture is rich in stories, tales, and poetry. Kings, brave heroes, beautiful women, dangerous journeys, battles, 
fearsome dragons, and other worldly creatures are all themes in the stories told. But no one writes them down on paper, everyone knows them, most of them by heart. The long winters when people are cooped up indoors are good times for these ancient stories. For centuries they have been kept alive in the hearts of Scandinavians by storytellers. However, the great literature of the Viking Age is in danger of being completely lost to time, as the old die and the young no longer remember. Finally, with the advent of Christianity in Iceland, Christian churches taught Icelanders to write. Educated men in Iceland saved it all, from poetry to family legends and feuds, by writing them down. Snorri Sturluson, an Icelandic writer who helped develop the Viking Age literature that flourished in Iceland in the 13th century, Sturluson himself produced many of these works, Poetic Edda and Prosi, Edda, book about Norse myths and heroes, Heimskringla, a book about the kings of Norway, Scandinavian history and most likely the story of Egil. Sturluson is a legal speaker at Iceland's Althing, a poet, historian and politician. Most of what we know about the Viking Age comes from Icelandic collections of poetry, stories, sagas and stories. The Vikings grew crops, grey gardens and raised animals, which was typical of the food produced in the ancient economy. Along with oats, barley and rye are the grains that grow best in northern climates. From these grains, the Vikings made beer, bread, stews and on porridge. Barley is mainly used to make beer with hops for flavor. Flatbread is a daily food made from a simple dough made from ground oats or barley, water added, then flattened on a griddle and grilled over a fire. The Vikings consumed a variety of vegetables including cabbage, onions, garlic, leeks, radishes, peas and beans. These garden crops are sown in spring and harvested in late summer and fall. Women and children gather wild plants and herbs, mainly green vegetables. These wild vegetables include stinging nettle, dock plant, watercress. The Vikings also grew several herbs such as dill, parsley, mustard, horseradish, and thyme. In fact, fish probably made up 25% of their diet because most Vikings lived on the coast, so they ate all types of fish, both marine and freshwater. Additionally, they ate what they produced on their farms or what they could hunt or gather. Viking farms were often small but large enough to keep a family or extended family fed during good years. Their food is seasonal, so they may have a lot of food to eat at some times of the year and very little to eat at other times. On a typical day on the farm, the family will eat two meals. One is the meal of the day served one hour after waking up, the other is dinner at the end of the workday. For breakfast, adults can eat some stew left over in the cauldron from the night before, along with bread and fruit. The children will eat porridge and dried fruit or perhaps buttermilk and bread. Dinner can be fish or meat stew with vegetables. They can also eat some dried fruit with honey as a sweet treat. Honey was the only sweetener known to the Vikings. Vikings drank bear, mount or buttermilk every day. The feasts will include a foods familiar to everyday dishes such as meat, fish, poultry, vegetables, greens, breed and fruit, but more diverse than regular meals and much more. Again, the Vikings liked to drink Kirkand mead at parties because it would help them eat better and keep their bodies warm. Mead is a strong fermented beverage made from honey. Women cook meat, vegetables and bread on the fireplace, an open fire pit in the middle of the hallway. The Viking wife grilled meat over a fire or boiled it in a stone pot or iron cauldron. Vikings loved rich stews, so meat, vegetables and wild vegetables were often stewed in cauldrons with water. Bread is baked on a flat stone or iron grid over a fire. Most Vikings had salt and pepper, while more expensive spices were imported and added to the foods of the wealthier Vikings. During the Viking period, that cold and harsh environment was the main condition that influenced the type of clothing that Vikings wore. They have a social hierarchy. People with higher status are those with more silver coins. They can sew more beautiful and higher quality clothes. You might think that Viking clothing was created in dull and drab colors to suit the often gloomy lands. But in fact, research experts have shown that their clothes are bright and colorful. The color that reflects prestige value as well as monetary value the most is red. It is more expensive because it originates from the root of the matter plant, a plant that is not native to Scandinavia but must be obtained through trade. So its value is pushed up 
very high. Some of their clothes even have intricate, decorative patterns on them. From things like weapons and boats, we can see how the Vikings like to decorate. For men who build ships hunt, raid or do any job, it is important that they keep their bodies warm. Basic clothing is lighter and shorter in the warmer months and longer in the winter. Men will often wear aodai. The outer layer will be a bit thicker and longer, maybe knee length. Pants are relatively simple. They don't have pockets, they can be loose or tight. Perhaps unsurprisingly, men's underwear is primarily made from linen, which feels more comfortable against the skin than wool. Turning our attention to Viking women, we can see some differences. For women too, keeping warm is very important. The underskirt consisted of a linen petticoat that extended from the shoulders down to the ankles. On top, there is a slightly shorter length wool halter dress. The two layers are tied together at the handle with two iron or bronze brooches. If it's a woman of very high status, then yes to have gold brooches. Both men's and women's clothes do not have buttons. They also don't have buttons, nor do they have practical additions like pockets. But perhaps beanies and hoods will be more popular with both men and women in the winter. So, the clothes they wore in battle were much sturdier. The cloaks and tunics would have been much thicker. Perhaps they were made from the skin of sheep or some other animal. In battle, a sturdy leather belt around the waist would hold the weapon securely. The belt will hold axes, swords, and other small tools. They will also wear thick armor with a shield to protect themselves from attacks with swords or axes. However, in addition to iron helmets, their armor is not too thick or too heavy because most of it hinders mobility in battle. They freely equip themselves with weapons to defend themselves, but only the wealthiest Vikings owned a complete set of weapons including swords, axes, spears, bows and arrows, shields, helmets and armor. Those who could not afford only carried axes or spears and shields. Even the poorest had their axes on the farm. The most expensive weapon is the sword because it requires a lot of iron to make. Rich people own swords as the most prestigious weapons. The sword has two blades and is about 35 inches long. More people will carry axes and spears. The axe has a long handle, is light, and is capable of causing great damage with a variety of heads with cutting blades from three to six inches. Spears take less iron to make, so it's not too difficult to own a spear. In particular, most of them have round shields for protection. Vikings also equip themselves with socks, scarves, and even gloves in winter. They are not knitted, but made using the nalbing technique to ensure they are very tough and sturdy. Their shoes are usually ankle high, although people also wear boots. Both are made of leather. Even though they are made of leather, they don't last more than a few months and certainly never more than a year. Viking art is emblematic of the surprisingly ornate material culture of the Northmen. Vikings loved intricate decorations, and they decorated many things they used. Weapons, jewelry, runes, ship woodwork, and even their common everyday objects. They love abstract and intricate animal designs and lots of interwoven lines. Animals depicted in their art include snakes, horses, wolves, birds, and other fantastical unreal animals. As the Viking Age progressed, craftsmen diversified designs, and six distinct but overlapping artistic styles developed. Each style is named after the region where the decorated object was found. Some outstanding styles that we may know include Oseberg style, existed for most of the 9th century and appeared in some Viking religious icons. Its main features are the attractive animal motifs and zigzag animal shapes. The feet cling to the outline, neck of the creature, another creature, or other parts of its body. The fascinating beast must have reflected something in Viking art culture because it has existed for 150 years. The Bore style is named after a set of bridles buried at Bore, Norway. While the attractive beast remains, the Oseberg style sinful creature now boasts a triangular head, a cat-like face with round eyes and protruding ears. This style seems to be completely Nordic and has no outside influence. It has appeared in Iceland, Russia, England showing that Viking art existed wherever they went. 
Boar was prominent from the late 9th to the mid 10th century. The gelling style appeared in the early 10th century and continued to exist for about 75 years. The styled animals are so shaped and intertwined, with curved heads, spiral hips, and braids. Bore and gelling overlap and are sometimes both used on the same object. The Mamem Viking art style emerged from the gelling style and became prominent in the second half of the 10th century. Mostly naturalistic lions and birds, as well as snake and leaf patterns, are depicted. The name comes from a small axe head from a burial site in Mamem, Denmark. The axe head is carved, then plated with silver. On one side of the axe head is a leaf shape and on the other side is a stylized ribbon-like bird with tassels on the wings and tail. The first half of the 11th century featured the Ringerica style in Viking art. Lion-shaped animals still appear along with plant motifs and leaf patterns. Also during this time, runestones became more prominent and were decorated in the Ringerica style. Ringerica animals are extremely curvy and skinny, with almond-shaped eyes and thinner, longer tendrils. The Urnas style dates from 1050 to the 12th century and is named after a wooden church in Urnas, Norway. Carved wooden panels reveal animals twisting and turning with long forward-facing eyes. Snakes and plants are also featured. This hound-like creature appears to be fighting a snake. Today, the legacy the Vikings left behind to the world is truly valuable. Viking style is everywhere and is especially famous in Europe. Their mythical stories have inspired many famous movies around the globe, and especially their will, indomitable spirit, and famous somewhat brutal recklessness have left behind people today. Lessons in overcoming difficulties, conquering and exploring new lands and seas in the world. Thank you for listening. What do you think about Viking stories? Please comment below to let me know, dear. Don't forget to click the subscribe button to support me. See you again in the next videos.